Bill, would you mind leading us in prayer? All right, so I've handed out sticky notes with passages on it for those of you who uh, volunteered to read. Thank you. Um, it's a big room and it may be hard to hear, so I would just encourage everyone to kind of follow along um, with the readings, especially those online, because they, we won't be able to hear it online if you're streaming today. Another thing I want to say as we get started is I think um, what you're going to find is that we can identify with the Psalms. We can identify with the things that are being talked about in the Psalms. Sometimes I think that we uh, walk away from reading the Psalms feeling like it doesn't necessarily apply to us, but I promise you that it does. Uh, when we read these Psalms, especially the Psalms of David, it seems, but when we read these Psalms, you know, like with David, we tend to think he was a, a warrior king. I am so not a warrior king, right? Like, how could I ever identify with what he's going through? But if we think about when he talks about suffering and trials and all of these things that are happening to him, if we can put that in the context of our own lives and think about the times where we have suffered or we have been tried, the message, the reaction to that suffering that David shows us in the Psalms is the takeaway. We should react to our own suffering in the same way that he did, even if our suffering isn't on the same scale or same, you know, same reasons, etc. So keep that in mind as we go into these Psalms. And we are going to start today with Psalm 6, and I've titled this one, Waiting is Hard. And right away, I think that that title should probably resonate um, with most of us, Waiting is Hard. Another title for this would be uh, A Prayer for Mercy. So, whoever has Psalm 6, 1 through 3, if you could read that for us, please. All right, so in this, um, in this psalm, I want to start out talking about David's emotions. Um, emotions are not bad. Um, it's what's bad is when you suppress your emotions, right? We talked a little bit about that uh, a time or two ago. Um, and so I think it's important for us to recognize where David is expression, expressing his emotions to God. And in this case, he feels the anger of the Lord. He says, O Lord, uh, o Lord, rebuke me not in your anger. He feels that. He knows that the Lord is angry at him. He says that he is languishing. He feels weak. He feels sick. He says, my bones are troubled. And you get this idea that he's shaking. You ever, you ever um, find yourself in a situation where you're literally so fearful that you start to shake? I have, and it could be for a number of reasons. It could be that, that you know you're living uh, in sin and you realize that and you start to be afraid of that. It could be that something terrible might happen and you're fearful that it will happen and you're not sure how you're going to deal with it. There are a number of different ways uh, or scenarios that you can find yourself in where your bones are so troubled that you're shaking. And then also in the same kind of language, he says his soul is greatly troubled. And another, uh, I think the Christian Standard Bible says he is shaken with terror. So these are David's emotions right now. And the first thing I want to point out is he's telling God this. He's not just keeping those emotions to himself. He's talking to God here. And we tend to think that, you know, these are, this is Hebrew poetry. And you tend to think that, oh, David wrote this poem or he wrote this song. 
and he wrote it, you know, kind of for the poetic value or whatever. And those things are true. David prayed these to God. He prayed them. That's what they are. They're prayers. And so he's telling God what his emotions are. And my first thought question for today is, do we feel this way about sin or trials? And when, when we read the Psalms of David, he might be talking about enemies surrounding him. I want us to think about our enemies as even sometimes being our own selves, our own desires. Uh, it could be Satan. It could be actual other people, but like, don't limit your thinking here when you're reading these Psalms, especially of David. So anyway, sorry. Do we feel the same way when we uh, are suffering from sin or trials in life? Anyone care to comment on that? Theron? So you and I have talked about the project of making life. I'm going to project, so maybe the mic will pick it up. Um, you and I have talked a little bit about this, I think. You've alluded to this. But I think, like most people, um, you know, emotions are bad. You're not supposed to show those. But yet, I'll confess, I'm a passionate person. I'm an emotional person. I react to things. But I find, generally, the people around me don't like that. And so, I, I struggle with what to do with that. And you and I talked about this. Maybe the answer is, maybe we need to take it to God. Even the people around us, maybe this is a burden only God can really carry. That's a good point. So sometimes your emotions are such that you don't know how to express them. Maybe the answer is expressing them to God. And that, that will help you process them, right? Because the thing about emotions are that they need to be processed. If you don't process them, if you bury them away, if you try to ignore them, it, it only gets worse with time. So you have to process those emotions. Doing that with God is definitely helpful. I think... The other point that I'm trying to get across here in this first section of the Psalm 6 is that um, David felt really bad about, I mean, th this feels like he's writing about a, a sin that he's committed, something that he's done. He really feels bad about it. It's not just a, you know, forgive me for my sins, wrote prayer that you say, you tack on at the end of whatever other prayer that you're saying. It is. I am shaken down to the very core of who I am. That's what the soul is. The Hebrew word for soul is nephesh, which actually means the neck, which is where they thought life sprang from. It's his entire life, his entire being is troubled. And so think about that when you're studying these Psalms. Do you react to your own sins in the same way? Any other thoughts on this before we move on? I, uh, I don't know, actually. I don't know if this, this psalm is in reaction to Absalom. I don't remember. Some of them are, yeah. And, and even with Absalom, I, I would argue that there were plenty of wrong choices that David made that led to that situation in the first place, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Psalm 31 is the next one that we're going to do today, actually. Yeah. Yeah, his bones are troubled, right? Yeah. I, I like that wording. Any other thoughts? All right, let's look at David's response to these emotions. First of all, we know that he talked to God about it, right? But he asked God not to rebuke him in anger. There's an interesting thing, takeaway from this here. He doesn't ask God not to rebuke him. Why do you think that is? He knows, he's just. He knows he's, God is just, right? And so sin has consequences. And um, what the best we can hope for is really mercy, right? And so he says, don't rebuke me in anger. Have you ever punished your kids in anger? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I know, I know that that's a, you know, something you don't want to publicly raise your hand over, but it's probably true of everyone who's ever raised a kid. And you know the difference between rebuking your kids or punishing your kids when you're angry versus when you've had time to calm down, right, and process it. 
Um, and so David knows that as well. And he's asking God, don't rebuke me. And because God's anger is, is, is massive. It's, it's fear inducing. It's, it's, he can completely destroy us. He also says, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there is some of that to it as well, uh, which feeds into this next point around do not discipline me in wrath, which again is he's not saying don't discipline me. He's saying don't discipline me in wrath. He understands the value of the discipline of God. Uh, he understands the fact that he needs that discipline. So he's asking God to do it, uh, to not do it in wrath, but instead to be gracious, to have mercy, to heal. And then in verse three, he says, how long? And I, what, whatever version you were reading, Chuck, he says, how long twice, right? right? How long, how long? What does David mean by how long? Until you restore me. Yeah. So this is the waiting part that we were talking about. Waiting is hard. David is in a situation where he needs healing. He needs grace. He needs mercy. And because he is, he's feeling shaken down to the very core of who he is. And he's asking how long it's going to take God to give him that. Any thoughts on this before we move to the next? All right. How does this relate to Jesus? Um, who has John 12, 27? You can read that for us real quick. Okay, so Jesus is asking God to save him for this hour. And he uses the same language in this verse. It, of course, you know, it depends on which versions you read and everything. But the original uh, language translation, my soul is greatly troubled. Jesus said those same words. What was he talking about? What was he troubled about? What was Jesus troubled about in John 12? Anyone? Crucifixion, the cross. He knew he had to be lifted up on the cross. It was, he was greatly troubled by that. This is the same language that David used about his own sin. If you think about that for a minute, that's pretty powerful. We should feel about our own sin the way Jesus felt about the fact that he was about to be crucified. They use the same exact words. All right, let's go on to the next section. Uh, who has Psalms 6, 4, and 5? Return, O Lord, deliver me. O, save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? All right. So we start out with David's emotions again. How was he feeling in these two verses? He was feeling separated from God. And we know that our sins separate us from God. He was also feeling close to death. And again, and we don't have to spend any more time on it, but the takeaway here is, do we feel that way when we are living willfully, um, trying to direct our own footsteps, trying to satisfy our own lusts? Do we feel this way, separated from God and close to death? Um, I think it was Mark Roberts who preached a sermon once. Uh, yeah, it was Mark. Um, he talked about hell. And a lot of people have a hard time with hell because they, they think, how could a loving God create this place and send you to it that is so terrible? But that's not even, that's not how it works. Hell is a place where God is not. And anyone who goes there chooses to go there, right? Because when you sin, it separates you from God. And so you say to God, I don't want to be with you. And he says, okay, you don't have to be with me. And that place where God's presence is not is, is a horrifying place. So what's David's response? He says, turn, look at me or return to me. He knows God has turned away from him because of his sins. And he literally asked God to turn and look at him. Um, he says, save me. And he appeals to God's love. Um, and then 
he also commits to serving God. And some of this may seem a little foreign. I mean, like we understand these concepts about separation from God, God turning his face away from us, and then wanting that closeness again. But I would strongly encourage you to start adding these phrases into your prayers. Talk to God like he is literally a person you have a relationship with because that's what's supposed to be happening. And so if you know God has turned away from you, ask him to turn back. Ask him to look at you. Um, ask him to save you. And then don't forget to commit to serving him. Um, and, and David says in verse 5, you know, for in death there is no remembrance of you in Sheol who will give you praise. What he is saying is, if you destroy me for this, there will be no one left to praise you here for the salvation. But if you save me, if you heal me, if, you, if you're gracious to me, I will let everyone know what you've done for me. Um, and so in that way, he's committing to serve. And so my question here is, do we make the same commitments um, when we're talking to God, especially when we're going to him to confess? Um, are, are we in our confessions saying, and I will repent and I will serve you and I will praise you for your mercy and I will tell other people what you've done for me. I think we tend to go to him all hunched over and fearful and shaking and we ask for forgiveness and then we crawl away. Please cross our fingers. I hope he forgives me. But David is like, he's confessing and he's saying, this is what I'm going to do because he knows God will forgive him. He knows it. And so he knows how he needs to change his life and he professes that to God. Any thoughts on this before we go to the next section? All right, who has verses 6 through 10? I'm worn out. <coughs> Okay, so let's start with David's emotions again. What is he feeling in this section? Well, he's, night after night, he can't sleep. Um, he talks about how he is spiritually and physically fatigued. He says his eyes are swollen with grief. He talks about how his couch or his bed is drenched with weeping. He's been weeping all night instead of sleeping. Um, and so my question to you is, David putting on a show here, is he being hyperbolic? Darren? I'll jump on a grenade here. <laughs> um, so like a lot of people, I've always wondered, and I think about this, what is it about David that gave him a heart, you know, that, that appealed to God so much? And one possible answer is he was sincere. I mean, he was sincere in wanting to do the right thing, and he was sincere in repentance. And he knew God and realized he couldn't hide anything from him. And so he was just very open. And I wonder sometimes if that's something we need to try to emulate. A hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. So he, he was a genuine, he was sincere, um, and he was feeling the appropriate emotions the appropriate, to, to his situation. Um, and, but it's a stark contrast, I think, to sometimes how we feel um, when we are living you know, sinfully or if we commit a sin to God that we don't necessarily feel it as intensely as David is talking about here. And so I just want that to be kind of a, uh, an object lesson for all of us, a takeaway from, from this psalm, that when we're in this situation with God, this is how we're supposed to feel. Um, so I have a typo here, but this is supposed to say is David's response. Um, in verse eight, in a lot of commentaries, have a, a little bit of a hard time dealing with verse 8 because David's talking about up until this point how 
how shaken he is, how he's close to death, how he's staying up all night weeping. And then in verse 8, his tone changes completely. Um, and he, his confidence returns. You get this sense of relief starting in verse 8. Um, he has a renewed hope. He says God has accepted his prayer. And he said God has heard his plea or his weeping. And so my question is, um, has his circumstances changed yet? What's changed to make him feel this way? Sudden shift in confidence. What changed? Did something happen? That's exactly 100% correct. He got it off his chest. He confessed. He knew God would be faithful and, and forgive him. And so it is that that gives him confidence to then change his tone um, through the rest of the psalm. A lot of times we go to God and we confess our sins and we still walk around troubled. We still feel troubled in our souls. But I did this thing. Like, I don't deserve that forgiveness. Um, it was Mark Roberts again. I listen to Mark when I work out, so I quote him a lot. But um, it was Mark Roberts uh, who said that if you're feeling guilty about your sin after you confess them to God, then you're telling God his plan of forgiveness is incorrect. Do you ever think about that? I don't deserve that forgiveness, God, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like feel bad about it for a long time. I'm, I'm going to... I'm not going to like do things in public worship because I shouldn't, because I'm, I've done these terrible things or I, whatever it, it, it is. I'm going to shy away from getting close to you or serving you or whatever, because I'm so guilty and I feel so guilty. You're telling God that his forgiveness is not correct. Think about that. And then hopefully as you think about that, you can start to have the confidence that David had here because he knew that God forgave him. Now, um, how does this relate to Jesus? Did Jesus ever feel this way? Verse 8. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Who has Matthew 7? I think I have 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many, many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Okay, so who's Jesus talking to in that passage? In that last verse, depart from me, who's he talking to? He's talking to sinners, sinners who claim to be disciples, right? That we've served you and we've done all these things. Um, and he says, depart from, depart from me. So Jesus, when he comes again, he's going to cast judgment. He's going to judge those who just outright sin. And he's going to judge those who think they're in an okay relationship with him, but yet they don't get it. Um, this is the, again, it, I marvel when Jesus and David use the same exact words. David has just confessed his sins and then immediately with that confidence that he has and he knows he's been forgiven, he says, depart from me, all you workers of evil. I think there's a number of different ways that we could kind of um, interpret this or take lessons away from this. Maybe David was with people who were uh, encouraging him to be sinful. And so he's saying, now that God's forgiven me, I don't want to have anything to do with you. Maybe even it's people who claimed to be righteous, but were giving him bad advice and taking him down the path, the wrong path. Um, there's probably a, even more ways to interpret that. But David is saying to those evil influences the same words that Jesus will say when he comes in judgment. Any, any thoughts or comments on this? Yeah, Mike. Yeah. But you look in First uh, Kings chapter eighteen, you have Elijah who just is on top of the mountain to slay, he was slayed all these uh, false prophets. And then he gets a 
Yes, yes, 100 percent. And we're going to talk about that in, in some of the other Psalms that we're going to study. David talks about angels quite a bit in his Psalms. He talks about them encamping around him, talks about them blowing away his enemies like chaff. And I don't think that's just poetic language that that happens. There's a spiritual realm we don't have much knowledge about. Right. Um, Daniel prayed for an angel, right, to come. And, and what was the angel's response? Sorry, I'm late, but I had another battle over here that I was working on. Um, that's exactly right. So when we pray to God, he is actually sending us help. Completely agree. Any other thoughts? Christy? Yeah. Uh huh. And verse 16, let us draw near with confidence. I think the version is saying boldly uh, to the throne of grace to receive mercy. And that's exactly what they were doing here. Yes. So very, very much what are the Psalms looking right here? Yes. Yeah. So, so this Psalm is Hebrews 4 16, yes. approaching the throne with confidence or boldness. It is that in action. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, let's go ahead and move on to Psalm 31. Uh, I called this one Into Your Hands. Or another uh, title would be A Plea for Protection. Sorry for the tiny font. It wasn't quite as tiny in the back room. Um, who has verses 1 through 8? Okay. Do you award let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge. Fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, your namesake, lead me to guide me. Put me out of the, pull me out of the net. They have secret way for me. For you are my strength. Your hand has been my spirit. You have redeemed me. All right, so we'll start again with David's emotions. He views God as a refuge. He views God as a strong mountain fortress. Um, who, who has Micah 4? Okay, so this passage, and there's many others, show us a pattern in Scripture of referring to God as a mountain, as a fortress, uh, as a, a fortress on a mountain. Um, the language here uh, is, is very relatable to people in this time. They had to worry about how they were going to defend themselves, right? So if you put your city on top of a mountain, then any invading army has to climb up the mountain before they can even engage in battle with you, and you're there ready and waiting with the, the, the advantage of the high ground, uh, like Obi-Wan. That was for you, Theron. Um, 
And what other, like, in, what other mountain fortresses do we know about in the Bible? What, what comes to mind if you say mountain fortress other than God? Edom. Edom was built on a mountain, and they thought they were indestructible because of that. Um, and so, so we, if, we, if we pull all those together, we think about God in those terms, he is the place that you can go for safety because he is, uh, no one can, can defeat him. He is high up on a mountain. In the end of Micah there, it talks about Mount Zion, and we're going to talk about that in one of the Psalms that we study later in the class. But Mount Zion is, is kind of used as a symbolic uh, way of representing God uh, because his presence is there on that mountain. Now, what is David's response? He says, into your hands I commit my spirit. Makes sense, right? God is his refuge. He's the, the only place where you can go for safety. So I'm going to commit my spirit to you. He, he basically says, I'm relinquishing control to God. Another Mark Roberts quote. Um, he talks about sin being an act of treason. God has total authority over our lives. We give him complete control. And if we take that control away from him and do what we want to do to fulfill our own desires, we are actually committing treason against his rule over us. It's a very interesting way of thinking about that. But David here is stating how he understands that he is in complete control of God. In verse 6, um, he says, I hate those who, pray, who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. He sees sin as God sees it. He sees these actions as being evil and he hates them. That's another key um, in the battle against sin, right? Is if you try to see it the way God sees it, if you see the true evilness of these things, then they become less appealing to you. In verse 7, he talks to God about his trials. Um, and so my question for us before we go, go to the next section is, how easy is that for us today? How easy is it for us to say, I commit my spirit to you. I give you complete control. I am going to see things in my life the way you see them. And, I am, and when I encounter difficulties, I'm going to come to you and talk about it. That's easy, right? It should be easy. I mean, it's simple. Simple and easy aren't always the same things. It's simple, but uh, it's, it's difficult to do. And so hopefully, yeah, go ahead. Um, I think it's sometimes hard for us to see ourselves in Christ. And for him to have, in Luke, when he's on the cross and he says this line, where I commit, you know, into your hands I commit. Even Jesus, in all of his perfection, as a God, part of the Godhead, he did that. And so... Yes. To give things over to God and to commit ourselves to Him. Right. In time. That's, that's exactly right. And we talked about, I think it was last time, about how He was perfected through suffering, which means if we want to be like Him, we need to suffer as well for His sake. Phil? If there was anybody that was capable or shouldn't feel prideful, what is it? That's a great point. Yeah. Letting pride get in the way makes that hard. If you are as humble as Christ, it becomes easier to do these things. So, speaking of Luke, um, who has Luke 23? And Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Okay. So... This is interesting. Again, it's a situation where Jesus is using the same words that David used. David says, into your hands I commit my spirit. That makes sense here, right? David is not close to death. He's saying that for whatever the rest of my life is, I'm giving it over to you completely. You have redeemed me, right? You have redeemed me, and so I'm giving my life to you completely. Jesus is saying this, 
and his last moments on the cross, into your hand I commit my spirit. What does he mean here? He's giving his life to God at moments before his life's being taken away. And why doesn't he say, complete this quote and say, you have redeemed me? What's that? Jesus is doing the redeeming? Maybe, maybe. So here's my thinking on this. Our life is longer than just here on this earth. And so when you talk about commending your spirit to God, that is an eternal thing. And Christ was redeemed three days later. He was resurrected and he was given more life on this earth, right? So in the same way that Jesus can say to God in moments before his death, I commit my spirit to you. He, he also knew he would be redeemed. He would be resurrected and he would be with God. So when we say these words to him in our prayers, um, it carries that additional meaning. It's not just redeeming in the sense of your sins have been forgiven, but it's redeeming in the sense of we too will someday be resurrected and live an eternal life with him. That's kind of where I was going with that. Any thoughts on this? Comments? Okay. Who has nine through whatever that is? Eighteen? Be gracious to me, O Lord. <laughs> Okay, so David's emotions again. What is he saying here? He's saying that he's wasting away from grief. He feels like he has spent his whole life in sorrow. Um, we, when I was a kid, we used to go on long car trips. And um, inevitably, someone would say, like my mom or dad would say, I feel like I've been born and raised in this car. You know? And it can feel that way sometimes when something unpleasant is happening for a long time. It feels like that is the extent of your existence. And that's what David is saying here. His whole life has been spent in sorrow. He talks about the strength failing and his bones becoming weak, which for a warrior would be a very, you know, uh, troubling thing to have happen. He also talks about being an object of dread to his neighbors and how they, they uh, avoid him when they see him. My, my uh, I'd like to just pause for a second and, and, and again, I mean, I know I do this a lot, but can we identify with this? Especially that neighbor part. You ever feel like you're an object of dread to your neighbors? It sounds like you had something contagious. Um, I'm going to put a slight twist on it. <clears throat> um, and I didn't necessarily plan to say this, so apologies if I, if I can't get it out. Um, I, I've shared my troubles with my youngest daughter, Janie, right? And, and she's had a lot of, of trials with her mental illness, and she's attempted suicide many times. And I can say that in, you know, in the beginning, we didn't talk to people about it because we just we were trying to deal with it privately. And that wasn't a good thing. You need to share 
what you're going through with your brothers and sisters. But then it can also get to a point where it's like, I just want to go to church and just be normal. I just want to just go to Bible class and worship and just be normal. But, but pe well-intentioned, loving people can come up to you and you see the pity on their face and they don't know what to say. And it's a kind of, it's a reverse of what David's saying almost in that you dread that interaction. But I bet on the other side, there's a little bit of dread too. What do I say? I don't know what to say. I've never experienced something like this. This has got to be really hard. Do I go up and I just, hey, how's it going? Or is that insensitive? Or, you know, like it's a difficult thing. Um, now, the good thing about this family here is um, we just power through it with love. Um, and we have a close relationship with each other and that helps. But I, I find that to be a similar situation to what David's talking about. People are seeing what he's going through and they kind of don't know what to do with it. So they're avoiding him. There is a little bit, I think, too, of that. Um, they don't want anything to happen to them. So they just steer clear. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and his his friends saying, "Hey, you you must have done something really bad." Yeah, well, that and, and the fact that in in the book he he specific, specifically articulates how those around him, his neighbors and um, those who he counted on and relied on, kind of turned their back on. Him. Yeah, they, yeah, they all turned his. Yeah, that's a great point. And remember, when we're reading these, we don't have to always think about sin. We can think about trials. And in, his, in Job's case, he, was, he had not sinned, right? But he was going through very terrible trials in his life. Okay, so what's David's response to this? He says, I trust in you, O Lord. Uh, my times are in your hand. What does he mean by that? What, what does he mean, my times? Before he committed his spirit to him, what is he doing here? He's saying, not only is my life in your hands, everything that's happening around me, the, all the times in which I exist, the things that are happening, they're all in your hands. And, and that is uh, a comforting thought. If God is in control of everything that's happening, even in a situation that Job was in, if he was the one in charge of that and orchestrating that, then it's easier um, to have trust in him. He, he asked him to rescue him to, to look at him, to save him. This is all language that we've seen before. This is the pattern with David. He talks to God about his emotions and he asks for God to look at him, to save him, to be gracious to him, to have mercy to him. And then he declares that he is going to serve him and tell others about what God has done for him. And so we, I don't think we have enough time to even probably read this section. Um, what we'll do is um, we'll do the last section of Psalm 31 next time, and uh, then we'll go to Psalm 42, and we'll try to do 62 as well. We probably won't get to 78. Any last minute comments or observations, questions? Yeah. Yeah, and the scripture refers to him actually as, as a prophet. It's right. We don't normally think about that, but David certainly was warrior, king, poet, um, musician. Yeah, he, he did it all. All right, thank you for your participation.